All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Toshi Kuayama. I am the manager of atmospheric processes research section of the research division at California Air Resources Board. <clears throat> I am also the contract manager for this project. Uh, so before I begin and introduce you to our speaker today, um, I would need to actually go through a little bit of announcements and I'll be going over a brief uh, background of why this project is so important. Um, so, <clears throat> As we go through this uh, presentation, there's additional information on the website um, at CARB, um, as well as the bio biography of the speaker. You can actually go and visit our website at www.arb.gov or ca.gov slash research slash seminars slash Langford. That is the last name of our speaker today, L-A-N-G-F-O-R-D slash Langford dot H-T-M. And for those of you uh, that are online, um, I hope you can hear me. If not, then please do email um, at sierrarm at calepa.ca.gov. And if you do have any questions, you can also direct it there. Um, and we'll be uh, having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> uh, so for folks here um, in person, a uh, few housekeeping items. Restrooms are located just outside of the door. Um, if you go down... Uh, you'll see a stairs there, take a left, go all the way down the hallway, and you'll see both men and women's restroom there. Uh, cafeteria is located downstairs on the first floor. Uh, it'll be open throughout the period of this presentation, so if you need refreshments, please go down there. Uh, we also have uh, emergency protocols in case of fires or any uh, other uh, emergencies. Please do make your way out the door. Um, you see on the exit signs, to your back and left and right of you. Uh, do not take the elevator, go down the stairs, um, exit the main entrance and out to Cesar Chavez Plaza, um, adjacent of this building on I and 10th and wait there for further instructions until you can actually return back to the building. Um, lastly, we do also equip, uh, are equipped with fire extinguishers and EAD or AEDs, um, which are located just outside of this door to the right and then down the hallway. <clears throat> So just a quick overview, um, because this presentation is mainly on San Joaquin Valley, I'll be going over uh, general information of the valley. Uh, so San Joaquin Valley is uh, located just south of Sacramento, um, and it's approximately 250 miles long and on average about 80 miles wide, um, and it's bound uh, on both east, west, and south by mountains. Uh, typically. The air mass travels actually in from San Joaquin uh, River Delta uh, because of the topography, uh, but it does restrict airflow movement out of the valley because of uh, the mountain ranges that are located uh, surrounding the valley. And as a result of low misting heights, um, it really causes stagnation events, uh, limiting the vertical and horizontal transport of these pollutants. Uh, so because of these unique topo uh, uh, topographical and meteorological conditions in the San Joaquin Valley, it really presents a challenge for uh, us to uh, develop any regulatory efforts which would comply with uh, air quality standards. So on to ozone specifically. Um, over the decade or so, we, we have actually implemented, uh, with the help of districts, uh, air quality management strategies that have been effective at reducing uh, ground level ozone concentrations. Um, you can see that in 2000, we have a design value for a, our ozone standard, or ozone from 110 and currently down to about uh, just, just over 90. <clears throat> uh, but you can clearly tell that the ozone design values in San Joaquin Valley remains well above the National Ambient Air Quality Standard of 70 ppb. So there's more that needs to be done. So the background uh, ozone that transports into uh, San Joaquin Valley from the Pacific uh, exceeds 50 uh, parts per billion in many cases, uh, which is about 70% of the eight hour uh, ozone max. And so there's a critical need to really evaluate uh, the type of transport events and how the background ozone affects the San Joaquin Valley's air quality. So with further ado, I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Langford. Uh, he is a research chemist at Chemical Sciences Division of National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Earth System Research Laboratory. Uh, he received his Bachelor's of Science in Physics from Georgia Tech, 
uh, and earned his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of California at Davis. Previously, he has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Colorado National Institute of Standards and Technology, Joint Institute of Laboratory Astrophysics, and worked at NOAA ESRL uh, CSD and its NOAA uh, Aeronomy Laboratory predecessor since 1985, uh, with joint affiliation with Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences until 1992. That's a lot of acronyms there. Um, his current focus is tropospheric chemistry and transport with an emphasis on background ozone and air quality. Uh, for more information, you can visit uh, NOAA's ESL, uh, ESRL website uh, under uh, Andrew Lanford. So with that, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Andrew Lanford. At this mic. Thanks, Toshi. I see Ian, Ian saw that I had a promotion from, from Berkeley to Davis. So, so you know, you're, you're an upgrade. So, yeah. So, uh, as, as Toshi said, I want to talk to you about LIDAR profiling of uh, ozone in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, specifically from uh, Visalia. And this is our LIDAR truck parked here on a nice smoky sunset in, in late July of the Cabot study in 2016. Um, my colleagues, not only at Ezrael, but a lot of the folks who work with us are with Ceres, Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Science at the University of Colorado, so the joint institute here. Um, well, I, I really don't have to need to say much about this uh, to this audience here. Why do we care about ozone? As you all know, ozone is uh, a powerful oxidant. It's, it's uh, been linked to increased morbidity and mortality and lung inflammation. Also damages vegetation, including many food crops, which includes, you know, the very valuable agricultural industry in the San Joaquin Valley. And the Clean Air Act, of course, established a health-based national ambient air quality standard, or NACS, uh, designated ozone as a criteria pollutant. And that standard is reviewed periodically using the latest health research and was recently lowered from 75 parts per billion set in 2008 to 70 for the maximum daily eight-hour average, or MBA8. Um, this is very similar to what Toshi showed you. Uh, here's a plot of the ozone design values. There's the national ozone design value, which is the three-year average of the fourth highest MBA8. This is from all 830 sites across the U.S. And it actually now ticked down to 69.4 parts per billion. So the national average is below uh, the current NACs. But things are a little different in California. Uh, I just put San Francisco Bay Area here on for comparison, showing you a similar trend, uh, still a little bit above the, uh, the NACs. But in the South Coast Air Basin and San Joaquin Valley Air Basin, the situation is very different. You're, 40, 20 ppb above the current NACs in both of those air basins. Uh, these are some of the other air basins in the state. And these two basins are the only two extreme non-attainment areas remaining in the U.S. at this time. Houston used to be part of that excuse, exclusive club, but they've managed to drop down into the marginal level, which is where San Francisco Bay Area is right now. So still a long way to go for California. And this shows all those different sites which went into that national average. And this is just a day from June 2013, which was actually during the Elvis study when we were in Las Vegas, showing where all the high ozone is in the country on this summer day. It's in the West. And particularly, it's in the San Joaquin Valley on this particular day. Um, so. All these sites went into that uh, 830, all 830 sites went into that average. It's now below 70 ppb. So the question is, do stratospheric intrusions are really, especially Asian pollution transported across the Pacific, contribute to this high surface ozone? Is that preventing uh, the, the slowing down the decline of ozone in the valley as um, as additional controls take place. So that's where the California Baseline Ozone Transport Study came around in the spring and summer of 2016. And the study, which is sponsored primarily by CARB, but with 
contributions from uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the EPA uh, and San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District was composed of uh, measurements from a few different groups. San Jose State launched daily ozone sons up here on the coast at Bodega Bay and, and later on Half Moon Bay to try to get an idea of the inflow that's coming in for the Pacific. Um, Ian Faluna here and University of da California Davis Air Quality Research Center had their ground site at Chews Ridge, which is also very near the coast here. And they, in conjunction with scientific aviation, operated the Mooney aircraft, which flew around uh, the state, both as part of the residual uh, layer ozone study uh, in the first part of Cabot's, and then later on with some flights that were sponsored by uh, EPA and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District that, that looked further up north in the valley primarily. And then Ajax, our, our good friends at NASA Ames with the AlphaJet experiment, did a number of flights uh, around the valley. And then our part, which I'll really focus mostly on today, was to bring our mobile ozone LIDAR unit, Topaz, uh, out to Visalia, where we put it at the Visalia Municipal Airport, right next to, to California 99, and to measure ozone profiles. And for a part, the last couple of weeks of that uh, campaign, we also had a micro Doppler LIDAR, which, which just looked up and measured mixing layer heights. Uh, for a couple of weeks. We chose that location in part for a couple of reasons. One is the proximity to Sequoia National Park and Kings Canyon National Park. And the other is because of the co-located uh, radar and RAS wind profiler from, uh, from the Air Pollution Control District. So those are important measurements that we take advantage of in our analyses. So TOPAS stands for Tunable Optical Profiler for Aerosols and Ozone. Um, if you're not familiar with LIDAR, you know, basically we send out a laser beam which scatters off the atmosphere and some of that light comes back to us. And we send out a pulse, so from the delay time we know how far it's gone. So if we send out two pulses at slightly different wavelengths, one that's absorbed more strongly by whatever we want to measure, in this case ozone, then the second wavelength, by looking at those two signals in comparison, comparing them, we can measure ozone as a function of distance from the LIDAR. And that's, that's known as differential absorption LIDAR or dial, so, so you might hear that. Uh, this system uses an iSafe cerium LICAF laser. There are only two of these lasers around. Uh, uh, our colleagues at NASA have the other one. And we not only measure ozone, but we also measure aerosol backscatter in the ultraviolet. And that's a very useful measurement that I'll be talking about a good bit here today as well that we can use uh, in part as a tracer for where air masses are coming from. Now, this system is unique and the, the LIDAR points up, but we have a big mirror that sits up here on top that can deflect the beam out at different angles as shown here. And by putting together uh, segments of these, we can create a composite vertical profile that goes from all the way almost to the ground, 25 meters up to about six meters. And we cycle through these angles and get a profile about every eight minutes. Notice that's a log scale there. And um, this is the only system that does that. LIDARs have a blind spot, you, you know, for the first several hundred meters where they're not able to measure. And by scanning here, we're able to get all the way down to ground level, which is very useful for air quality studies. Uh, we're part of the tropospheric ozone LIDAR network, which has uh, several other systems uh, around the country. There's six total, including one in Canada. Um, the vertical resolution changes with altitude from about 10 meters at the surface up to 900 at the top of the range. Um, so we took the system, we put it out at the Visalia Municipal Airport, and we operated for a total of 440 hours over 43 days during the Cabot's Field campaign, which was broken down into two intensive operating periods. One, uh, late spring to early summer kind of measurements in, in May and June, and then later on in the, uh, in the summer, late July into August. And, and this is all the measurements, both the aerosol backscatter up top 
and the ozone measurements during those two campaigns. And this black line down here along the bottom, that's the mixing layer height, which is inferred from the co-located RAS uh, with the wind profiler. You see those are very low, uh, 500, 600, maybe 800 meters on a good day. Uh, very low mixing layer heights, uh, primarily because of the subsidence associated with the upslope circulation and return flow, uh, with the larger scale substance associated with the North Pacific High, and also with the latent heat fluxes associated with all the irrigation in the valley. So, so it's, it, it really was counterintuitive and a surprise to us for it to be 105 degrees outside and the mixed layers 500 meters deep. It just took a while to wrap our heads around that. So you can see that there's a lot of ozone. You know, the red is concentrations of about, above about 70 ppb. There are a lot of layers up high, a lot of ozone up high, and there's a lot of ozone down near the ground, particularly during certain periods. Times, sometimes there's a lot of aerosol. This is the Sobranis fire uh, contribution I'll talk about more. So each one of these um, little stripes here actually represents about eight to 16 hours of measurements, continuous measurements. The system is automated, but it's not autonomous. That couple of people have to be there to run the thing. So that's why it did not run continuously. And these, those gaps that you see here are related to sleeping. That if you had a crew of two out here at any one time. So this just takes that little section right there and blows it up. And that's 12 hours of measurements. And this, this, this is not a particularly exceptional day. Uh, it's a pretty typical day, really, which, which just shows the sort of things we typically saw out there. One, there'd be ozone in the afternoon near the surface within the boundary layer. You see the boundary layer outlined here by the aerosol. Um, and then elevated ozone layers aloft that would form in the afternoon, typically. A little bit of left of the nocturnal, um, uh, the shallow nocturnal boundary layer here where ozone is destroyed at the surface, uh, higher aerosol during those periods. Then we often saw marine layers uh, with very low ozone, kind of in the, uh, above the top of the, um, the elevated ozone layer. And then often there were layers of high ozone up here aloft, which are, which are either related to stratospheric intrusions or more often to Asian pollution layers that have been carried across the ocean. By and large, those pollution layers had very low aerosol, just like the stratospheric intrusions. Uh, not always, but, but most of the time. And that's because, you know, these, these pollution layers are formed um, when the pollution gets sucked up from the boundary layer over East Asia by the um, uh, warm conveyor belt of these developing cyclones. And then it gets carried across the Pacific and then mingles with the dry air stream as it comes down over the West Coast. And more often than not, there's a lot of cloud processing that takes place during that transit within the cyclonic systems. And that often removes pretty much all the aerosol in these plumes. So many of them don't have any aerosol to speak of. But down near the surface, there's lots of aerosol, um, again, within the mixed layer and also within this elevated layer there. So if you take this section, the lowest two and a half kilometers, and blow that up, and then you superimpose the winds from the co-located wind profiler and the boundary layer height inferred from the temperature profiles from the RAS, then you, you get another level of information see that the aerosol is primarily within the, the mixed layer, which on this particular day was about 600 meters deep. And these are the horizontal winds. These are not vertical motions. And you can see down here near the surface that you've got westerly flow that's developing in the afternoon. This is upslope flow that's carrying pollution from Visalia towards the Sierra. And then you get a return flow, which creates that elevated layer aloft. You know, this is westerly flow that's coming off the Sierra and bringing a layer back over the valley, both high ozone and high aerosol. 
So at first glance, you might look at that without the winds and say, oh, here comes uh, this ozone layer, which is coming down, and now it's coming down to the surface. But that's not what's happening at all. It's, it's actually the other way around. The ozone's going from the surface and then back up into this buffer layer, as, as Ian calls it, uh, which persistent feature that you see on most days up above the Central Valley. You'll also notice, you know, one thing about these layers up here that everything is pretty laminar. You don't see a lot of vertical motion. You know, you, you would get these layers up here um, that, that would persist for many, many hours, and they're not going up, they're not going down. Um, and part of that's reflected here in the fact that you can't measure winds up here in these layers because, you, you know, the radar profiler requires uh, changes in refractive index. Uh, so, so basically, there's got to be some kind of turbulence structures going on in layers. And an extremely laminar layer will not uh, produce a radar signal. So, so the wind profiler runs out of gas when it gets up into some of this more laminar stuff up here. And, and here, this just shows, again, what's happening uh, with a little bit of a cartoon. We get the transport from the mixed layer uh, up into the Sierra, Sequoia, et cetera, and then that compensation flow, which completes the circuit, and you get the substance here. So as you know, if you've flown over the valley, these persistent layers, uh, which are created by this happening day after day with a little bit different lift each day, so you, you get this finely layered structure up there above the valley. Well, we'll talk a little bit about the aircraft measurements. We were fortunate in having both Ajax and scientific aviation platforms out there, and as part of their flight routines, they would often do a spiral profile around the LIDAR or a missed approach or some combination of those. And we were able to compare the measurements during those, uh, those uh, profiles and missed approaches. And this, this, this basically are showing the results of those bin measurements, that we have good agreement to within five parts per billion uh, on average between the aircraft platforms and the LIDAR. LIDAR is shown here in gray, and the aircraft measurements are in red. Um, fewer points here, primarily because that plane's moving a lot faster than that plane. And perhaps a little bit of a, of a systematic difference here between the LIDAR and, and AJAX, uh, pretty much right on between the LIDAR and scientific aviation. But everything agrees to within five parts per billion, so within co the combined uncertainties of the measurements. Uh, it's, when we do intercomparisons in the field, you know, and we, we, we go out for these in situ measurements and we try to get our inlets as close together as possible, you know, for these comparisons so they'll be right on. Well, you know, we're using data here that was measured within 10 kilometers because, you know, you're not interrogating exactly the same physical space. So there's a spatial variability which also goes into these comparisons, and that's why they're been like that. We were also, since we can take the LIDAR all the way down to horizontal, basically, able to compare with in situ monitors, both the monitor we had there at the Topash truck. And these, uh, these gray points show how that comparison looks. But primarily what's going on there is because the truck was parked about less than 100 meters away from one of the busiest highways in the country, there was a lot of titration uh, that took place uh, during those measurements. So if you take all those measurements here in gray, and then you only look at the points where the wind was more than five meters per second and coming away from the highway, then they converge and you get good agreement between the measurements. Uh, likewise, you can compare our measurements to the measurements made at the, at the CARB sites in Visalia down on Church Street and Hanford, uh, 10 kilometers and 22 kilometers away. And you know, there's pretty good agreement still between those two, despite that spatial separation, which tells you that there is a fair amount of spatial averaging and homogeneity in the valley. So let's go back. Before this study, we knew very little about the vertical distribution of ozone above the San Joaquin Valley. There just hadn't been very many measurements um, to take place. So that was one of the, um, the things we really wanted to learn um, 
And uh, that's interesting. All right. That's not the plot I wanted to show you, but uh, um, this I meant to show you the ozone plots up here, and I guess I got the backscatter plots on there. But it gives you some idea of what's going on. So, so we're going to compare the periods when there was high ozone down in the valley with what's going on up above. And, and you, you can also see the message here from the aerosol measurements, that during the first IOP, there was a period in early June when there were exceedances. And this is looking at a lot of uh, the regulatory monitors down in the Visalia, Fresno area, including uh, Porterville, et cetera. And there were a lot of exceedances that peaked on about June 4th. And you can see there's a lot of aerosol up there. I'll show you the ozone in, in, in a minute or so. And then in July, and this coincides with the Sobranes fire, which started July 22nd, that dashed line, and immediately after that, there was high ozone measured in the central part of the valley. Then it cleaned up for a couple of days, and then high ozone again. And you, you see that in the aerosol down here, primarily smoke. So I'm going to focus on these periods of what's going on when there's high ozone measured down in the valley at the surface. So we'll start with this one, which uh, is a combination of regional photochemistry. And there is a stratospheric intrusion up there, but it's not really relevant to, uh, to what's going on, as, as we'll talk about later. So here's the ozone during that same little window period up there. You can see a buildup of high ozone up to about almost three kilometers up here. And that's well above the mixed layer. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the data from the fourth up there. Uh, there was a problem with, with the measurements. And, but there's no reason to think that that boundary layer is not uh, right around 500 meters. And that's pretty much what we see from our aerosol distribution. And then this thing up here, this is a stratospheric intrusion. There's ozone uh, descending down in a tongue up above uh, four kilometers or so. So during this period, this is the synoptic situation. There was a really strong ridge over the southwest. Um, that led to stagnation and unseasonably warm temperatures for early June. And so there was a lot of photochemical production of ozone. And you can see that in, in the, the ozone MDA-8s from Air Now, which are plotted over here, that on the 4th in particular, there's high ozone throughout the valley as well as in the south coast air basin. And that is, is pretty similar. Then it starts to, uh, starts to subside. And at the same time as you've got this high pressure, and these surfaces I'm showing you, these, these are 350 hectopascals. So you know that's up above eight kilometers um, up there. And this ridge is really deep. And you can still see it up at, uh, at that, that high in the troposphere. But on top of that ridge, there's a little low pressure system that moves across it. There's a little cutoff low there that, uh, that moves across California. So you've got this high pressure coming up from the surface and giving you the photochemical production. And then you get a tropophase fold associated with that low pressure aloft, which comes down on top of that. But that stays primarily up high, um, the intrusion. You see low aerosol in the intrusion, high ozone, high aerosol in the photochemical episode. There are the measurements from the fourth and both a lot of aerosol, ton of ozone. And one thing you'll notice is, and this is a little unusual, there are a lot of southerly winds up here, this one to two kilometer layer. And if you look at the high split back trajectories, that a lot of what's happening up above the boundary layer, this high ozone is actually coming from the south coast air basin that's been lofted, lofted up uh, over uh, the San Gabriels and, and San Bernardino Mountains and carried upward into the valley. Down at lower altitudes, you've got the normal flow, which comes through the Carquinez Strait and down the valley. Uh, so this, this was pretty much the only episode we saw where there was this transport coming from SOCAB up, up into the, to the base. Primarily, it was influencing ozone up here. OK, well, let's look at the, um, 
the second example here, and this is the Sobrani's fire. You see all this enhanced aerosol right in here. Uh, this is also the fire, but I'm going to consider that separately. Um, here are the ozone measurements over that time. There's also a little bit of stratospheric air up here aloft. Everything down here is related to the fire. So then the boundary layer and then these layers up above the top of the boundary layer. So the fire, it burned, all told, 130,000 acres over about 10 weeks. And the first two weeks of that fire overlap exactly with the second IOP of, um, of, um, of Cabot's. And uh, you know, it destroyed 57 homes and 11 outbuildings over that period. And it started really fast. It burned 16,000 acres in five days and 57,000 acres over the, the three weeks or so, 16 days uh, associated with the, um, uh, the second IOP. This fire, you know, has is, is, is kind of gotten a lot of attention because it, at least at the time, was the most expensive fire in U.S. history in terms of the suppression costs, you know, not the damages and, and everything else, but how much money was spent trying to put that fire out. And th there were four million gallons of retardant dropped on that fire uh, over that 10-week period. Six big air tankers and 18 helicopters. I mean, just a massive, massive effort, which has been, the wisdom of that has, has been questioned uh, uh, since that time. Now, this fire, this is a picture that, that Ian or Danny took, uh, taken from Scientific Aviation, I think, or maybe not. But um, that's from, maybe it's from Cal Fire. And this fire, in part because of its coastal location, the smoke plume didn't rise very high. It got carried when the winds were from the southwest, it got carried towards the valley here below about three kilometers altitude. And it was about 200 kilometers from where we were at the BMA here. Now, also during this period, uh, we had another fire, the Goose Fire, which it also, first 24 hours, it started out really fast on July 30th, but it was hit pretty hard because of, of, of uh, populated areas around there and was pretty much, you could see, 1,824 hours. Well, it, before they got out, it only burned 400 more acres. So they hit it really hard. But it started on the afternoon of the 30th. And with this location up in the foothills, that plume tended to rise higher than what was going on um, uh, further west on the coast over here with, with the Silver familiar with the goose fire, or the goose on fire meme, which is uh, fun. So the plume was evicted into the, the San Joaquin Valley Air Basin in, in late July. Here, here's the plume. And then once it got into the plume, it, it was, or into the basin, it was dispersed into really a smoke haze. We, we were never really looking at the fire plume, per se, but this uh, distributed haze, which spread all up and down the valley here. Um, there's the 27th. Here's the 30th, where the goose fire pops up here just briefly right there. Brownie smoke. And in addition to the LIDAR sitting here, uh, we also have a few aeronet sites, which are located in the region, including one in Fresno and one in Bakersfield down here, which kind of bracket on either side uh, by Zelia Municipal Airport where the Topaz was parked. That's about 65 kilometers and 150 kilometers or so. And I plotted over here the data from those two sites, which are shown in colors. Here's Fresno, here's Bakersfield. And I've also plotted the integrated backscatter from the LIDAR. Uh, so our backscatter measurements, which gives you an idea of the column distribution of aerosol as well. And there's, there's very good agreement between the two. And also good agreement uh, between what's happening in Fresno and Bakersfield. Again, because this thing is primarily this diffuse cloud up there. There are day-to-day differences, and, and there are plenty of them, and things appear a little faster in Fresno than they do in Bakersfield. But the overall appearance is very similar 
at all three sites. These are uh, just some pictures I took from, from the VMA uh, on July 29th, one a uh, few hours before sunset and one right around sunset where you can really see that smoke haze up there. Bonding backscatter profiles. Uh, seeing all this stuff, if you look straight up, most of that's around one kilometers. It's, it's all between one and three kilometers up there. So here's some of the topaz measurements during that period starting on three days, July 24th, uh, 25th, 26th. And this is the first appearance of, of the smoke in the aerosol as, as a discrete little plume around two and a half kilometers. And then there's more diffuse stuff. And over the next day or so, we see more of these little whiffs at two and a half kilometers uh, above what the radar is able to get for the most part. But you can see there's a lot of westerly flow here on these two days, um, and well above the top of the mix layer that's happening. This is actually another Asian transport layer, more Asian transport aloft. I mean, it's, it's there uh, much of the time, these transport layers. These, as you can see, again, low aerosol up here with the transport layer but high aerosol with everything that's related to the fire. This is the fire, this is the fire. This, this actually is not, that one is not the fire. <laughs> but uh, then on 26, the wind shifted, became more northerly and blew a lot of that smoke haze uh, down from the Visalia area. And we didn't see very much of that. Uh, next three days. The 27th, these were the days when there was a maximum smoke above the valley. And, and we saw both the highest integrated backscatter and a lot of ozone. And you know, looking at this in the previous plot, you see high degree of correlation smoke and ozone. Look at that. It's, it's, it's clearly, clearly coming from the fire. Um, so this is um, that northerly flow right up here uh, on top of the westerly flow. I mean, the winds are very, very dynamic and very complicated there in the valley with, with the inflow from the Pacific interacting with the upslope flows that form, the, the return flow and the substance associated with that, and the thermal up valley flow, which go, also goes towards Bakerfield and, and and amplifies uh, the inflow. And during the night, that typically forms a low-level jet, which you can see right there that the wind's uh, stronger down near the surface. And, and that can also, as Ian, uh, Ian's group can tell you, can facilitate some mixing from that buffer layer down towards the surface. So this is when the highest ozone was measured. In the San Joaquin Valley, any time during the Cabot study. In fact, any time during 2016, that highest measurements. Okay, the next three days, um, similar things, high ozone coinciding with the fire. Now we see some ozone, a uh, little bit of aerosol and a little bit of ozone up high um, and another Asian transport layer up above that. Again, very laminar looking. Then the wind shift, uh, they actually become more southwesterly at the coast, and the plume from the fire goes up towards Modesto, and there's less smoke happening down for those first beginning of August in uh, San Joaquin Island. Now, we were fortunate in also having the aircraft measurements, and these are some of the measurements from Ian's uh, group uh, in scientific aviation on July 27th, and, and I won't be able to talk much about that, but. They did a flight, a couple of flights. They did a flight out to, um, out to um, San Jose here and back, which went north of the main fire plume. Uh, and then they did an afternoon flight down around the valley. And those are also shown here. Um, uh, day flight to San Jose and then the flight in the valley. And they've also put out here the, uh, the um, ozone sound profiles from Bodega Bay and Half Moon Bay. And, on that day, they picked up high ozone layer down here, unfortunately below the altitude that the plane was flying, 
But even though the plane didn't go through the main plume, it, it sampled some of that air up above the top. And you can see at various points during that first flight here, they would fly through these little filaments where both CO2 and um, methane go up, and ozone go up. Methane, uh, methane as well, but I didn't show that here on the spot. Um, and then there's NO2 measurements down along the bottom. Um, so these plumes, and this one was actually in the second flight in the afternoon, and that was over the VMA, so we have LIDAR measurements during that period. And if you look at all the measurements from, from late July from the aircraft, these are primarily the measurements from, from the Mooney Scientific Aviation, but July 28th, Ajax also did a flight, and those are the purple points out here. And if you plot the methane and CO2 from these different filaments that the aircraft has flown through, you see, you see very different methane to CO2 ratios. And that gives you an idea of what kind of fire plume you're sampling, that in a, if you've got a high methane to CO2 ratio like this, that means you're sampling smoldering conditions, fire that came from smolder conditions. And the numbers like this are what you would expect from flaming conditions. And these, these ratios are very similar, for example, to what uh, the Ajax people measured during the rim fire when they did the measurements over, uh, over Yosemite. So this gives you an idea of what kind of burning is contributing to, to the plume, which is sampled by the aircraft. And then this is the same thing, showing the ozone production. And it's a little bit surprising um, that actually the higher ozone measured here was measured in these smoldering fire plumes. And again, looking at that in more detail right there, but it's a little, little counter to what I would have expected. I would have expected the flaming fires, fires which emit more NOx, smoldering fires emit more ammonia, uh, would produce more ozone. But a lot of interesting data to look at from both the aircraft and the LIDAR. And again, down here shows the LIDAR measurements in the filament right there, which corresponds to those black points. If you go back and look at the, um, just the LIDAR data, we can get an idea, not, not production rates, but how much ozone was enhanced in that smoke haze as it came over the valley. And this shows the measurements made within a, a window around two and a half kilometers the gray points are all the measurements made during um, the second IOP. And then the colored points here correspond to these little windows right here on July 25th. These are the blue points, and, um, which are shown here with ozone and shown here with the, uh, the backscatter. And 24th, 25th, you know, when we were first seeing this uh, ozone and smoke appearing above the VMA. Very strong correlation here. And the range of the slope gives us both an ozone to, to backscatter rate, which ultimately I'm hoping to be able to, to generalize um, from, from the measurements with the aircraft to ozone to CO2 production. But, but the span of measurements here, for example, the red points on the 24th, shows that there's 40 or 50 ppb of ozone enhancement. Again, that's, that's the difference between the highest points and the lowest points associated with, with that. So a lot of enhancement up there, again, at two and a half kilometers. You do the same thing down one and a half kilometers, which is when we started seeing most of the smoke uh, later on, 27th, 29th. Same kind of analysis. You get a much lower ratio here, but there's still 30 to 40 ppb of ozone enhancement between the low and the high points uh, associated with that smoke haze. And finally, well, not quite finally, but if you look up higher, there's not a lot of smoke that ended up up high, particularly from the Sobranis fire. Again, there's there that there was actually appeared to be either no net production or even some uh, destruction of ozone in, in the higher altitude uh, plumes that we saw. 
both the little bit from the Sobranis, um, this part from the Goose Fire, and then a little bit we saw in June from some fires in Arizona. No real production up at those altitudes. Now, we also have to consider, one thing you also notice is that unlike what's happening down here, where the backscatter and the ozone exactly coincide, um, there's a little bit of a vertical offset here. So that's Finally, in the boundary layer, um, we see 20 to 30 ppb of ozone enhancement down within the boundary layer associated with quite a significant impact. And right there, July 27th, that the measurements got up to over 100 parts per billion for the MDA-8 site there in the valley. Um, finally, when the wind shifted again after this period, the plume came back into the valley, so we get the Sobranis fire. But we also got an Asian pollution layer up there. Uh, and this one, unlike the others, appeared to be descending over the next couple of days. Uh, here again are the winds. You see the laminar layer. There's just no radar return from this thing. Very clean. And it looks like it's getting all the way down to the top of the boundary layer. So did any of this pollution reach the surface is, is the question. And here we've blown things up again. And if you look down at a few different altitudes here, you see the backscatter go down as that cleaner air comes down, cleaner, well, different kind of pollution. You know, air, low backscatter air comes down and displaces uh, the air that's been influenced by the Sobranis fire, which has a lot of particulates in it. And so you see that it's getting down to the top of the boundary layer, again, 500 meters deep. But ozone doesn't do anything, doesn't change. And coincidentally, it's just because the ozone concentrations in this air here, around 70 ppb, that's influenced by Asian pollution, are almost exactly the same as what was in the, the smoke haze from the Sobranis fire. So they both have about 70 ppb. So if some of the Asian air got down there, but it didn't make any change in ozone. Because it... um, so this more generally, you know, looking at this question of whether any of this stuff is getting down to the surface, I mean, we see it up there all the time. Uh, look at this period here in late June, which you notice I didn't talk about before because surface ozone is low. So it didn't contribute to any kind of exceedance down near the surface. But it was kind of a perfect storm because we had a major tropopause fold here, classic signature. This is ozone associated with a plume from the Goliath fire that uh, was taking prescribed burn in Kings Canyon National Park. It started on the 12th. And finally, there's Asian transport up here up above, uh, primarily up above five kilometers. So you can see, if you look at the synoptic background again, here's a big trough. Classic situation, big trough moves across the west coast. You often get tropopause folds that form on the western flank of these things and bring ozone down. You can see it here in rap chem analyses. There's the tip of the fold down here. Again, this is at, at about six kilometers, 500 hectopascals, so it's the same. Uh, it gets down to its lowest off Baja, California. There is some Asian pollution associated with that, which you can see in the, uh, in the um, CO distribution over here. And then we have FlexPart, which is a particle dispersion model. And then our colleagues, Stephanie Evan and Reunion Island, did these calculations for us. And this is at the same altitude. And now you can see uh, this is a stratospheric ozone tracer, tracer which is coming in California. And then some Asian CO tracer thing. So this is comparing topaz measurements to the flex part analyses. Here's the stratospheric ozone tracer. Here is the Asian CO pollution tracer. Look at these periods that I've just highlighted here between the uh, 
arrows, so, uh, or the, the lines, so we've got the intrusion over here. You see the model does really picks that up quite well, possibly shows some surface influence there. This stuff does not show up in that tracer, but it coincides pretty well with what's going on with the Asian pollution tracer, uh, particularly on the, on the 14th. And this is just blowing the same thing up. Again, you can see this is, tropos this is stratospheric intrusion here. After it. Very often, again, because the pollution can be carried across the Pacific by the cyclones, then, then it, as it descends, as the dry air stream comes down and brings down that upper troposphere, lower stratospheric air towards the surface, it entrains that transported pollution and brings it down with it. So they're often associated, uh, but they may lag by a day or so. Here's some measurements from our Ajax colleagues uh, up here. They did a flight on, on the 15th, and where they flew, uh, they, they did a spiral profile over Visalia, and did a spiral profile over Bodega Bay where the ozone sound was launched. And their measurements, these are a little hard to see, ozone, water, CO2, and methane. So down here, they picked up that Asian plume, which had elevated ozone, uh, elevated methane. It's dry, upper tropospheric air, uh, and a little bit of elevation of methane. That's CO2. And then the Goliath fire, you see elevated CO2 a little bit of ozone, maybe. This is just superimposing their profile. Passed over, um, pairing those two. And I've overlaid it here on top of the LIDAR, so if you can't see it, that's a good thing. Uh, and they get up to just the very bottom of that layer up there of their profile. So did any of this get to the ground is the question. Well, again, as I told you, this, our system is automated, but it's not autonomous. And we did 24 hours straight of measurements here, and, and then we, we really had to go sleep. We only have one team out here. But FlexPart says some of this may have gotten to the ground. So did it? Here. We're fortunate to also have some in situ measurements from Joel Burley. These were made at the White Mountain Research Center. So on, on the other side, the White Mountains, you know, are, are east of the Sierra. But these are very high altitude sites. Uh, some it's sitting up there above four kilometers. Uh, and even the lowest site is above three kilometers. So they're much higher than any of the sites which are operating in the Sierra. Um, and lo and behold, you do see ozone go up when we were asleep at uh, the top of White Mountain Summit up, the MDA got up to over 75 parts per billion. All of those sites went up, then they went down. Then they went up again, so they probably sampled some of this Asian blue. Well, what's happening lower down? Well, in, in the valley, and, and even at lower Kauia at, at uh, 1.9 kilometers or so, ozone goes down. No increase in ozone. In fact, it goes down over those few days. And that's even more pronounced if you look at Crestline, which is everybody's favorite site because it tends to measure the highest ozone in California most of the time, uh, up in the mountains uh, above LA. So it gets all the ozone lofted up from the basin there, and it, and it sits there up near Lake Arrowhead. And the dotted lines here are the measurements from Crestline. Uh, the solid is from Porterville, and during this period, you know, they both down. In fact, during the stratospheric intrusion, Crestline saw the cleanest air it saw all summer. Uh, and and basically, what's going on is well, you're you're taking by the time it gets down here, this UTLS air, upper troposphere, lower stratospheric air, has 60 to 80 ppb in it, which out in the some places would cause an exceedance. You, it'll put you up above 70 ppb. But if it displaces air that's got 80 to 120 ppb, things actually get cleaner. So ozone goes down. And 
this, this is one of my pet peeves is, um, is treating ozone like you've got a big bucket of ozone and, uh, and you put in so much from local production, so much from regional, so much from Asia, so much from the stratosphere. It usually doesn't work that way. You just can't look at it that way because what happens with, with certainly with the stratospheric intrusion most of the time is you don't just add stratospheric air to the bucket. You empty the bucket and refill it with this UTO there. So, so you, can't, you, you can't use the bucket model for, for this kind of thing. Um, but sometimes you can. And we've, we've done measurements in Las Vegas and um, during both the Elvis campaign and Fast Elvis in 2017. And if you look at that same period, here are those peaks at the White Mountains. Well, ozone goes up in Las Vegas, and it doesn't quite cause an exceedance, but it got to about 70 ppb uh, soon after that. So why is Las Vegas different? And that's pretty much summed up in this, in this uh, um, slide right here. This little transect here shows Chews Ridge, Visalia, and then Las Vegas, Angel Peak, and, and down in the basin. They're almost exactly the same latitude going across here. And then here's the topography. And the difference is really seen here in the mixed layers. So these are the mixed layers that were measured by the Doppler LiDAR over two weeks in, in, in Visalia versus what we measured during Fast Elvis uh, during uh, uh, the 2017, so the next summer. And we, tip, we often saw mixed layers that were over four kilometers deep in Las Vegas compared to 500 meters down. That means that anything that comes across here at four or five kilometers, well, it's just going to go over the valley and most likely will go over the Sierra but then it's going to reach the mixed layer here. And here, just an example, contrasting one day from Cavitz with a day from uh, Fast Elvis, where we've got transport layers, Asian pollution layers in both cases. Uh, and this thing gets entrained and mixed into the, uh, the boundary layer. So in that case, the bucket analogy is a little bit more uh, reasonable. So basically, to conclude, most of the high ozone episodes during, in uh, the air basin during Cavitz were caused by local or regional sources. Now, that, that includes the Sobrani Spire, which is a regional source, uh, not necessarily a controllable source. But these, really, the strong stratification and shallow boundary layers, they just really inhibit the mixing of the transported ozone to the surface. Uh, it's up there all summer long, but it mostly just passes over California. Uh, at that latitude. Further down south, you'll get more transport, potential for transport to the surface because of the isentrope sloping downward. But at, at the latitude of, of, of the Central Valley, uh, you don't see a lot of that. Deep stratospheric intrusions can actually lower surface ozone. We, you may remember we saw that during Calnex, that in uh, the Los Angeles Basin, that uh, there was a major stratospheric intrusion. Same thing happened. Ozone went down. Again, if you, if, you take, if you take very polluted air and then replace it with UTLS air that still has 70 or 80 ppb, ozone's going to go down. But the Sobranis fire was really the big player uh, in July and August. And of course, the fire persisted for a, a whole other month and a half where, where we weren't measuring. Uh, I know Ajax has some more flights. I don't know if you have more flights. Yeah. So there, there was more production. But the end of July was really, really the big time. And it, and it was definitely the major, big influence for the highest ozone measured in the San Joaquin Valley during uh, 2016. And other than that, uh, a lot of people contributed to these measurements that uh, involved. Uh, happy to entertain questions. All right, thank you, Andy. That was a fantastic set of presentation. Uh, but Right now, uh, we'd like to open the floor up for any questions. Uh, any questions in the audience here? Oh, 
Hey, Andy, thanks. Um, you know, you say that this mixing from, I think it was a stratospheric intrusion, brought in 70 ppb or something, and that was what the boundary layer was. So you, you showed that the time series at the near surface ozone flattened out, but that was like at 6 or 7 p.m. it looked like. Which uh, time series? Well, the example you gave of the entrainment from the intrusion into the boundary layer, oh, and you said that uh, the oh, ozone didn't change the, because oh, of the that. Asian pollution layer. Yeah. Was it Asian pollution? That was Asian pollution, yeah. That one. Yeah, that one, yeah. right. So, but if you look at that trace, and the important thing is to keep in mind about this, in, this uh, Asian influence is that it's the difference. It's what's happening here as opposed to what's happening if there were no Asian influence, which would mean that the entrainment would actually be dropping the ozone, among other things. So a normal trace would have ozone that drops. What, you know, normally, if you look at an average ozone diurnal profile, it's dropping by 3 or 4 p.m. And so when you, when, when you can extend it into 6 or 7 or 8 p.m. even, that strongly affects the MDA8. That's right? true. So I, I think that's, that's an important point to make. You're not changing the instantaneous concentration much because of that mixing. Like you say, the 70s on par with what the boundary layer is. But it's very important for the MDA8 because if that layer wasn't there, you'd be mixing in much cleaner air, right? A lower ozone, and then you would have this uh, dilution effect happening, which is always happening. The sort of the baseline is there's the, there should be dilution going on. Right, and that and that is a little late. We, uh, you know, typically at that location, we would see it start to drop <coughs> around five, so so not as early as three, but 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 definitely, definitely. Definitely a couple of hours earlier than it did, and that's a good, that's a good point. And that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not saying that Asian pollution doesn't contribute at all. I'm I'm saying these major transport layers generally don't have an impact. Now, of course, everything that's happening at lower altitudes where pollution gets mixed into the kind of the hemispheric background. That's part of the background, which is coming in as well. And, and so that's underneath everything else that's happening here. And, and that's, that's something you can model, but not something you can easily measure. Uh, look at differences. Yeah, hi, uh, Darmel's Carb, and uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And I was very fascinated at how you teased out the wildfire smoke from the uh, anthropogenic contributions. And as we talked uh, before you did this, are you planning on doing that with some of the prescribed fire uh, data that you were collecting? Um, there's not a, there's a little bit of that around the time of the Goliath fire. Uh, I haven't tried that actually. I mean, there are a few hours of measurements we, we could do. And while I got the microphone up, could you infer, and I'm looking, I, I just saw Ian, so hi, Ian. Uh, is there a way to infer uh, vertical velocity from some of this stuff? Because that would be really uh, of interest to see how that's, that mixing has taken place right around the times of these intrusions. Um, later on, and in fact, during this period here, Ian, you know, we do have... Um, the Doppler LiDAR measurements. So we do have vertical velocities during this period. Yeah. Right. And, and, and maybe this is the day to, a day to look at, the 6th, August 6th. So that's the next to the last day of measurements. Um, so yeah, Dar, we have some a couple of weeks where we have vertical velocity, may have vertical velocity measurements. Uh, and as we talked earlier, you know, I, I'm always trying to tie this back into operational meteorology and the things we do with prescribed fire. How would some of this uh, data tie back into that synoptic? Uh, and I hate to use the word hectopascals, but <laughs> hectopascals, uh, 500 millibars and you know higher, because that's what we're always looking at operationally. Right. Well, again, in terms of the stratospheric intrusions, uh, they're typically associated with a trough. So if you see a trough on a 500 hectopascal plot, there's a 
good chance there's going to be a stratospheric intrusion. That doesn't say how low it's going to get. They have no surface influence whatsoever, but, but there is one up there, so at least. And during, during the high pressure, yeah, that's when you tend to get the stagnation events, uh, like I showed in early June, and, uh, and then the, the slow subsidence kind of tapping things is associated with that anticyclone, so. Um, but that's also the sort of situation where we saw the transport, these transport events, the mountain chimney type event that we looked at back during pre Kalinex, so, you know, where it was lofted out of the LA basin and transported into Nevada. Uh, so that will influence that transport as well. Uh, hey, uh, so you showed, um, you observed higher concentration of ozone during smoldering fire. Yeah. So how, so why, why is that? I don't know. I, that's, <laughs> that's, that, that's counter to, to at least the way I was thinking about fire. I thought more NOx. If the fire's producing more NOx, you're going to make more ozone. And there could be other factors, obviously. I don't think the fires are, are, are VOC limited in terms of the ozone. You know, we don't have the measurements. You know, the balance between NOx, you need the NOx and the VOCs to make ozone. So by having this much more VOC, even when you've got the NOx, um, I mean, we usually think of things as being NOx limited. And maybe Any other questions from the audience? Uh, anything from the web? I do have one quick question. This is more general than not. Um, <clears throat> so I know that your measurement campaign lasted for several weeks. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the you know, inferred information about the, the potential frequency of such events um, and what's the level of persistence throughout the year? Uh, which events in particular? The uh, uh, stratospheric intrusions mm -hmm. or right. Asian transport? Um, and they actually, I don't have the plot here, Mayun Lin made a nice plot, you know, showing the spatial distribution of where both Asian pollution and stratospheric intrusions are likely to influence the surface. And they look almost the same, again, because most of this episodic transport of pollution, you know, is associated with the same cyclonic systems that brings it across in the, in the free troposphere, four or five kilometers. Uh, and that tends to, pe it peaks with, um, the cyclonic activity peaks in the winter, but it's still quite strong in the spring. Um, in spring, you have more ozone in the um, lowermost stratosphere. So the intrusions, even though they're, it's, they're starting to become less frequent, uh, they transport more ozone downward. So kind of May and June is, April is when that's going to be most important. Uh, even though intrusions can happen later, in the, occasionally in the summer and the fall, but they typically don't bring as much ozone down as, as they would in April, May, or June. The same thing with the pollution plumes. The, you tend to see these transport layers during those same periods associated with the same systems. Later on in the summer, then a lot of that pollution that got sucked up by these cyclones now gets lofted up to higher altitudes by deep convection. And it's still coming across the Pacific, but it's up eight, nine, ten kilometers sometimes. It really is disconnected from the surface. So April, May, June is really kind of when you would expect both of those things to have the biggest impact. Any other questions on the floor? And again, as, as Ian pointed out, you know, there's, there is, in, a, in addition to this stuff associated with cyclones, 
there's stuff happening throughout the lower free troposphere that just gets more hemispherically averaged and becomes part of the background, part of what's coming into harder to measure with this sort of thing. All right, with that, oh, one more question. Um, I, I mean, most of the plots are up at the, on the Cabot's website. I mean, you can see individual, you can see the measurements. Uh, the graphs, these graphs themselves, do you, do you post these? Do, we do post them after the presentation. Yes. Uh, so you'll be able to just uh, go log into, or actually access our website, and then go to the initial uh, link that was provided in the very beginning. And then all of the presentation will be available there. I did, I did think of one more question I had. I, and you did a great job of quantifying the wildfire. And again, I appreciate that. How about the residual layer stuff, or what Ian referred to? Uh, what was buffered that called? Uh, the buffered layer. Right. And it's not the same as a residual layer. You know, oh, the residual layer, you get a deep convective boundary layer and you pump stuff up to some level and then as it decays, that stuff's left there. That's a residual layer. But this, this layer is, is created by the upslope and return circulation. So it's not, it's, it's, it's a different beast. So wouldn't they combine at some point or have, what are they, are they combining or are they well, separate? remember since the convective boundary layer it's only five or six hundred meters deep. There will be a residual layer there at five or six hundred meters, but the buffer layer is often up above one kilometer, one to two kilometers. So it's typically up above that residual layer. And and as you know, Danny and, and Ian have looked at, uh, for example, the turbulent mixing associated with a low-level jet at night, uh, which can mix some bring down that residual layer and, and even up into the buffer layer to some extent, uh, pick some of that back down to the surface for the next okay. week. So uh, what layer would I be looking at on this uh, slide to the left with, uh, at, you know, as it decouples and you have the uh, lower ozone at both the high and low level, but that middle part, what would that be? Would that be what you're calling the buffered layer? That, that's, yeah, that's, that's where the buffer layer would be kind of in here. Uh, this this is from the fire, and but you can see some. The, f the flow is not as strong as it was on the other day, but you can see, the winds are going this way from the mountains, and helping bring that back uh, over. Uh, a little cl clearer without the fire in that first example I showed. Here, between one and two kilometers, that'd be the buffer layer. Residual uh, layer should be right around here. Got, if you've got something left there. Uh, All right, thank you. All right, with that, uh, I would like to give Andy another round of applause, please. Thank you. Next question. And if there are any other questions, uh, lingering questions, please do feel free to email us at, again, sierrarm at calepa.gov um, or email um, Reed or myself and we'll follow up with Andy. All right. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>